Everyone let a shitload load from, from just shipping Far Cry 3. The team was so busy and we had, had our heads down because we had so much to do that we didn't have the time to like stop and take a look up and look around and see what other people were doing and, and realizing like, holy shit, the outposts are really cool. So we ended up shipping a game where the open world had a lot of like cool stuff, but it didn't have a lot of depth or meaning and it had almost no connection to what was happening in the story. And in fact, in, in some ways, the, the two were kind of opposed and they were kind of contradicting each other. Because on one hand, like the story itself had this like ticking time bomb of like, I have these friends that I need to rescue, but holy shit, collecting plants, finding that next animal I need for the next upgrade, getting that next skill point, oh look, there's a radio tower. Wait, wasn't I heading to that outpost? And then you're like, oh yeah, shit, my friend Keith's trapped in a basement. I should probably go rescue him. I'm a terrible friend. That was my main goal was like fix, like fix this shit, make sure that the story in the open world speak to each other, complement each other, strip everything down so that the story and the open world are the same thing and it's the same game. I think people have approached it from different sides. And I'm not, say I'm not saying that we're going to revolutionize open world games, right? That would be, it would be bullshit if I said that. It's just we, we're doing something that we're fixing the problems that we thought we, had, we thought we shipped with three. We were definitely aware of some of the tropes that we fell into unintentionally in some cases, intentionally in some. And one of, one of the one of the areas that we like, it was almost the first thing that we did was decided how we were going to address the kind of the white savior trope, right? Of the the outsider who comes in and helps simple people with his outsiders kind of more advanced understanding of the world. You know what I mean? It's like because the first thing we did was design Kirat as a place, so we we knew uh, we knew the history and the culture of the place. And then we decided who the character would be and where he would be from. And like the first thing we said was this guy is from Kirat. No matter what happens, like that is it, the most important thing is he is part of this world. He belongs here. That's where his, his parents are from. That's where his, his, his family are from, right? So when you go back there, it's a place you belong to. So the, everything you do is kind of part of your history and culture and background. But at the same time, we want to make him accessible and understandable. And the most important thing is like one of the key pillars of the brand, not even just the game, like the brand is discovery. So if this guy already knows too much, then as a player, I'm going to feel alienated by how much he knows, right? We still want to capture that the fish out of water kind of experience, like, holy shit, this is all new. This is a different culture because we're trying to build this authentic Himalayan culture. So we want people to, to in some cases, be shocked by it and to, and to learn and to discover. We came up with AJ Gale, who was, he was born in Kirat. Um, his mother and father are both from Kirat, but he left when he was three or four years old because there was, you know, there was a civil war in the country. His mother ends up fleeing the country and she, uh, she seeks asylum in the USA. And he essentially grows up from the age of like four in the US. So he's coming back to a country that he essentially doesn't know much about, if anything. But when he arrives back, everybody knows him. Everybody knows his mother and her acrimonious exit. Everybody knows his father because his father was the founder of the revolution. That's still happening today. That's still fighting the civil war. So just his name, AJ Gale, gets him in trouble. Even to the point that his whole life he's called himself AJ Gale, right? But his name is actually pronounced RJ Gale. So immediately he's like, oh, f even his name, right, is pronounced differently. And it's the thing that gets him in trouble. So the player and AJ kind of can have that same learning experience. But at the same time, as a player, you feel like you belong there and you're not coming in from the outside, um, kind of disrespecting a culture because that's where you're from. So are you guys worried about being seen as insensitive towards that part of the world that the country is based on? Um, well, I think that's one of the reasons we, we went there, right, was to really understand it and to get a better, a better appreciation of the culture. Um, and we're not, we're not specifically rebuilding Tibet or specifically rebuilding Nepal because we want to be, we want to be credible and we want to understand how that, how that part of the world works and functions. But at the same time, we also go to the trouble of making a, making a new country, a new history, a new backstory. Like we even made our own religion, right? Which is inspired by um, areas like Nepal and Tibet and the Himalayas, but it doesn't directly reference. So we're not going to actually step on anyone's toes if we want to kind of push the game into like uncomfortable spaces. Almost everyone you meet is from Karet. We have a few outsiders um, and they're generally bad people. The Jason Brodies this time around are the bad guys. Like the outsiders who come in and try and have their uh, escapist white savior fantasy are actually the bad guys. And you're on the other side of that. So it's like an, an evolution of us trying out our own ideas. And I must say, like, we probably won't get it, we won't get it perfect this time around either, right? But like. If we don't take risks, then everything will be boring. Like it's, it's easy to do safe.
um, and that's not it's not what we're about as a team. Like we don't set out to offend people. We're not like, oh, we're the crazy gang. You just have fun ideas and chase after them. So looking back on Far Cry 3's narrative as a whole, do you think it was successful? Um, I know that on Far Cry 3, people responded really well to character, particularly like when it came to uh, the bad guys, like the antagonists. Those kind of characters, people responded to much more than the, the friendly, I would say, the, the allied characters. The characters all had charisma and charm with it, right? They weren't just like, oh, I'm a bad guy doing stereotypical bad guy things. Like Vass was kind of a contradiction because he was, the things that he did were horrible and he was obviously crazy, but like the guy had lots of natural charm and charisma. Michael Mando is, is a fucking hot guy. He like this, and Vass was played as a very kind of, it wasn't intentional, right? But he was, he was kind of a, there was a, something sexual to the character. You were kind of seduced by him. And, and threatened and it's that level of like mistrust and charm and kind of being drawn in by this person and you naturally you know they invite you to come closer and you're like oh they're come closer, come closer and then they do something horrible you're like oh holy shit, I came too close and you realize that the door you walk through is now locked behind you and you're trapped in the room with this with the lunatic so is it possible to have a protagonist that's as likable as a villain? Well, it's, it's a challenge, right? And it's something, we, it's something we're, we're trying to do is to actually remove layers of, I guess, barriers between the player and the protagonist. It's more about making the protagonist relatable and kind of um, a, a vessel that you can like, easily step into and understand and then show them like the antagonists. And that's, that's, what, that's what makes the antagonist powerful. And the protagonist is more allowing you to fall into the world and believe that you belong there, right? And then you can start on this journey and start to meet some of these characters and then decide, are they good guys or bad guys? Or should I trust this guy? Should I trust the other guy? Will the main character talk in this game? Yeah, I mean, he talks when he needs to, but it was like, it was funny when we were doing the script review, almost immediately the first thing we would do would be like, okay, so how many lines does AJ have? Like, okay, okay, all right, cut that by 75% and then we would review it and then we would cut out even more. Whenever possible, we would set up a scenario where we know or we think we know how players would react. And so we would have, we would remove the line that the character would actually say and then have the other person react to it. Oh, you think that, do you? In that kind of way. So they kind of, they're like, oh shit, how did he know I was gonna say that? Whereas if, if, the, if the protagonist said that line, you're like, oof, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that. And then suddenly you're kind of broken out of the experience. I'm coming for you, Voss. You think that happened a lot with Jason and Drew? Well, it's hard. It's like it's super, it's super subjective. It's like some people, some people obviously think the way that he spoke, um, and other people don't. And it's kind of hard when you, when you kind of half commit to immersing somebody in a scenario, and then kind of you can pull them out. Um, and when the game, like, when you have six million people play a game, it's like it's hard to to hit that on the head. Whereas with an antagonist, when it's someone you're not supposed to be. It's, it's much easier to have them say something and, and guarantee um, an emotional reaction. But when you're in first person, all you hear is this disconnected voice that might not be agreeing with what you're doing. So again, it's just about uh, stripping away those, those barriers of immersion so that you can imagine yourself in this scenario. The story acknowledges that the game, when you run around, it's, it's hectic, it's chaotic, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Embracing the contrast of like violence and dark humor um, so very much in like a, like a, as much as I hate name dropping, like the easiest way that we've, we've learned to, to, to describe it to the, the, the rest of the team when we're like sharing the vision is like the way that Tarantino can like, he can joke and massacre at the same time, right? And it's that kind of contrast of um, almost ultra violence and really, really cutting dark humor at the same time. It's kind of the soul of the open world. It is violent, it is bloody, right? It's chaotic and messy, but at the same time it's like, you can't play the game for 15 minutes without smiling or sometimes even laughing, right? So for me, the story has to be a reflection of that. It has to be an honest, open understanding of like, this is what the game is. And I can't go to a cutscene and, uh, and have some like super earnest, like lesson uh, about the morals of, of, of life and love. It's like, that's, that's not what the game is doing when I'm not in this cutscene. So why, why try and force me down this path? Nobody threatens my planet. I see Blood Dragon as kind of a parallel series. It obviously doesn't exist in the same universe, right? We definitely weren't directly inspired by the reaction of Blood Dragon because it's, it's a very specific thing, right? It's like, it's the VHS era of um, over-the-top action movies. What was good about it was that it was, it was irreverent and it was self-aware. It knew what it was and what it was doing. Um, and in some cases, I think that's, that's something that Far Cry 3 
didn't like we weren't we weren't too self-aware we didn't acknowledge what we were doing if you know what i mean like uh in some places it was probably a little too earnest but then at the same time at least like interviews with the lead writer like you made it seem like the whole point of the game was that it was supposed to be a commentary on games do you see is that carrying forward into far cry 4 do you always want that series to be a commentary on games itself in a weird way no, because like at a, at a certain point, I guess that commentary becomes redundant, right? Like, imagine if every movie was a commentary about movies. Like, at a certain point, the movies would become movies about movies about movies. <laughs> like, at what point does that loop, like, what point does that snake eating its own tail end up eating, eating its own head? Right. I, don't, I don't know if that works. <laughs> In terms of narrative, like, I obviously have ambitions and goals about, like, creating something with a soul that has a message and something to say, but I'm not going to be, I'm not the guy who's going to tell you what you're supposed to learn from the game, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the game isn't, it isn't didactic. I'm not saying like, we have this message and if you don't get the message, then you didn't get it and everything falls apart. It's like, yes, we have goals and ambitions, but you'll never get me to tell you what they are because it ultimately belongs to you. And that's, that's the important thing is, right? We give, you, we give you tools, we give you a world, we give you an experience. And just like in gameplay, I want the story to be um, as much owned by you as it is by, by me or the writers or by anyone else on the team, level design, game design artists. It's all like we're, we're giving as much as we can to the player so that he can have his version of the story and he can, he can, they can tell us what they got from the experience rather than us like hitting them over the head with something that we want to force down their throats. Do you have like a high level message or like theme in the game that you hope players receive? Almost like a, a mystery, deeper meaning to it in a way? Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, you so can, look, you... After, after we ship, right? After we ship yeah, yeah. and people have had time to digest and like talk about it, then, then we can come back and I can tell you how much we missed by.